Picture, if you will, a bar in an American small town. And if we look inside this bar, we will find two characters who stop by for a drink. Now, each of these characters is facing in their life a dilemma, a central crisis that dominates their stream of consciousness. These are crises for which they can find no resolution. Meanwhile, across the bar, we find a jukebox. And this is no ordinary jukebox. It is a haunted jukebox. It appears to play songs on its own, and when it does so, the lyrics of these songs emanate out from the machine, carry across the bar, and this music in the air gently guides our characters' streams of consciousness toward perspective resolutions to their dilemmas. This is the premise of Juke Joint. It's a video game about a haunted jukebox that changes people's lives. It's a collaboration between Tyler Brothers and myself. And in this talk today, I'll be using it as a case study with which to explore a particular notion that I call the character content feedback loop. My name is James Ryan. I'm a PhD student at the Expressive Intelligence Studio. It's a research lab at UC Santa Cruz that's dedicated to treating artificial intelligence as an expressive medium. The name of this Proc Jam 2017 talk is Beyond Vending Machines, Character Content Feedback Loops. I'll spend most of the talk diving into Juke Joint because I'll be using that as a case study and in fact a platform with which to introduce this idea at the end of the talk of character content feedback loops. Juke Joint gameplay works like this. Two characters who've lived out simulated lives in a procedurally generated American small town stop by a bar for a drink. Each of these characters is facing in their life a dilemma. Let's say for the sake of illustration that both of these characters are facing the same dilemma, whether or not to leave this American small town that each of them live in. Across the bar is a jukebox. As I said, it is haunted. In this small game, it is specifically haunted by the player. The player is a ghost in this machine, and the only action that the player takes in this game is to select which song from the jukebox will play. Once the player, the ghost, has made her decision, the first set of lyrics from that song emanate out from the machine, carry across the bar, and this music in the air elicits in the characters a first round of thoughts. These thoughts are elicited by the lyrics and expressed in generated natural language. Next, the second set of lyrics from that song emanates out from the machine, carries across the bar, and elicits in the characters a second round of thoughts. Meanwhile, each of these characters is wrestling with that dilemma, whether or not to stay in this American small town or to leave it. Both characters begin roughly in the middle with regard to this decision. As they think thoughts, as their streams of consciousness proceed, they move along these continua, either left and right, back and forth, or perhaps straight away towards some decision. When a particular decision is reached by a character, a special thought is generated to express that decision, and then poof, that character leaves the bar, leaves the scene to go on with their simulated life with a newfound sense of clarity. When the last set of lyrics from the song plays, the game ends. 
Now, if some character is to be left on the scene with no resolution, no newfound sense of clarity, well, perhaps the ghost should have played a different tune. This game is deeply AI driven. It's enabled by an architecture that comprises two modules. The first handles stimulus processing. In this game, stimuli are the song lyrics, and this module handles how characters process these lyrics. The second works in response to generate a thought that's elicited by the lyrics according to how the character processed them. So I'm gonna discuss both of these modules in turn. This should give you a great sense of how Juke Joint works and what's going on. To begin, a lyric plays and a round of thoughts are elicited. So what's actually happening here is that these lyrics have attached to them a tag that captures their lyrical theme, if you will. So we, we as authors take a song, break it into a set of arbitrary chunks, and then we attach to each chunk a tag capturing its lyrical theme. Different chunks, of course, get different themes. So when a lyric plays, what's really being processed by the characters is this tag, this lyrical theme. And then the thought that is generated in turn has been elicited by that theme. Now, when a thought is elicited by a particular theme, we can think of that thought as pertaining to that theme in some way. Now, to understand how this all works, we need to look inside the mind of a character. And here we will find a receptor. This receptor is dedicated to disappointment signals in the air. It's dedicated to receiving the disappointment stimulus whenever that comes attached to a set of lyrics. This receptor has a voltage capturing how sensitive it is. The more thoughts pertaining to disappointment that this character has, the higher this voltage becomes. The higher this voltage becomes, the more likely this character is to have subsequent thoughts that pertain to disappointment. This is the first of several feedback loops that we'll see. This game is all about feedback loops. This talk is all about feedback loops. Now, in addition to this receptor, we will find several more. Other ones pertaining to the other lyrical themes. Two special ones pertaining to the dilemma at hand, uh, specifically each of its perspective outcomes. And then some other ones that pertain to some other concerns. We'll see what those are about shortly. Each of these has a voltage. Again, the voltage captures how sensitive the respective receptor is. And some of these receptors may be connected to one another by a synapse. When a character has a thought that connects two concerns, the receptors corresponding to those two concerns will form a synapse that binds them. This loosely operationalizes the notion from neuropsychology of fire together, wire together. And let me enter a brief disclaimer here. Uh, we're using terms like fire together, wire together, uh, synapse receptor, and so forth. We don't mean for this, and we don't claim, and it certainly is not, uh, an accurate simulation of what actually goes on in someone's brain. For instance, when they hear music or when they hear anything or see anything or encounter any kind of percept. We do not mean for this to be a, a accurate simulation. Rather, we're using these terms as common tokens because they're familiar notions. We all have an idea of what a synapse is and they actually map nicely onto the computational and representational strategies that we're taking here. So disclaimer, 
this is not an accurate simulation. We don't claim or believe it is. Okay. Now, just as receptors have voltages, synapses will have weights. The more often a character thinks thoughts connecting to concerns, the higher the weight on the corresponding synapse becomes. The higher that weight becomes, the more likely this character is to have subsequent thoughts connecting these concerns. Again, another feedback loop. Again, this is a game about feedback loops. And again, this is a talk about feedback loops. Now, the actual mind of a character will probably look something like this. There's a bit more going on. It's a bit more gnarly, but it's built out of simple components. Receptors, which have voltages and which may be bound together by synapses, which have weights. This here is the snapshot of the mind of a character, if you will. Now, in the beginning, the character's mind will look like this. But as they begin to have new experiences to live out their simulated life, it will build up until we get, again, a snapshot that looks like this, perhaps. Now, this snapshot is kind of cool. It actually encodes a lot of information about who this character is, about the life that they've led, about the difficulties and the concerns that they're up against in their simulated life. For instance, this character here has faced considerable disappointment. There's a pretty high voltage on that receptor. We can see that they're disappointed in their job. A synapse is formed between those two concepts due to them thinking thoughts that link them. In turn, they're committed to their partner by the same reasoning. This snapshot actually tells you a lot about who this character is. Now to fully understand how this was built up, we need to return to the jukebox. The jukebox plays a lyric. That lyric has a lyrical theme attached to it, disappointment in this case. And that music carries across the bar which means this disappointment signal is floating in the air. Well, to understand then how this is processed, we look back into the mind of this character. Here we see again this snapshot of what's going on under the hood. Well, now what happens is the disappointment receptor becomes activated because disappointment was the lyrical theme, which meant that that's what's being processed by this character. They're processing disappointment, so the disappointment receptor becomes activated. Next, that activation will propagate across each of the synapses extending out from disappointment. But that activation across the synaptic pathways will be slightly diminished. So all of these receptors have become activated by virtue of disappointment having been in the air. Well, these are then used to form a content request to a text generation module, which I'll briefly talk about next. But how this works is the system takes all of the receptors that have been activated, both by virtue of the lyrical theme, in this case, disappointment, and the spreading across synapses. And then each of these are placed into this content request. And you can think of this request as saying to the text generator, give me back content, give me back a character thought that you will generate. And I want one that pertains to disappointment, do depart, don't depart, this town, my job, and new job elsewhere. So these are receptor names. And on the other end of things, as we'll see briefly, uh, they connect to the content space, the things the text generator is reasoning over to produce thoughts. So this says, give me back a thought that pertains to these concerns. Now, one thing that doesn't capture is that disappointment is far more activated because disappointment was the lyrical theme 
in the air. So we don't want something that sort of equally pertains to those concerns. Uh, from a player perspective, we definitely want the thought to pertain most closely, uh, most significantly to the lyrical theme. So we want disappointment to be more heavily weighted in our content request. So what we do is, in the content request, we simply take the voltage on the disappointment receptor and we throw that in there. That was 5.5, so we put that there. And then to get weights for these other concerns, we look at their syn the weights on the synapses and we just divide those by 10. And we throw those in there. So now we have this content request that says, give me something that's about disappointment. And it should also kind of be about these other things because those are the concepts that are linked to disappointment in this character's mind. So express disappointment, but also express a lot about this character and what they're dealing with in their decision process with regard to leaving the town. So pull in these other concerns. And then back on the scene, a thought has been generated in response to that content request. And that thought is then displayed on screen for the player. Now to understand how thoughts are generated, we'll turn to the next module. Here I'm not gonna go into too much detail. If I did, that could be an additional talk on its own. Um, and this is not a talk about a particular method of procedural generation. It's a talk about a way of thinking about proc gen in a larger gameplay context. And I'll get to how it's about that in a moment, but for now let's briefly go into how the thought generation module works. So we have these content requests and we generate thoughts from them. So we can think of our text generator as accepting content requests, reasoning over them, and then reasoning over the space of content that it can produce to produce a character thought that best matches the content request. And again, the content request is just a weighted set of concerns. And then of course, when that content comes back, we display that on screen and everything's good. So content request in, generated content back. Now for this part, we're using a tool that I've developed called Expressionist. Uh, Tyler Brothers is also collaborating on this project and Ethan Scyther produced an early prototype. It's a tool for video game text generation. And it's a tool that specifically works in this sort of framework where you build content requests, specifying what kind of text you want back, and then send that off in order to get back content that is tailored to match whatever concerns are present in gameplay right now, which are captured in the content request. So what you need to know is it's a tool for text generation that can handle the kind of content requests that I just showed. You should also know that uh, this tool will be coming out very shortly, hopefully by the end of December. We're just uh, finishing up some tutorials and documentation for it. So keep your eyes peeled if you're interested in text generation in these kind of contexts. What else you should know for the purposes of this talk is that when Expressionist sends back a generated thought, or in any case, when it sends back generated text, it doesn't just send back the text, but it packages that text up along with some other stuff. So in the case of Juke Join, if we open up one of these packages, we'll find the generated text, but additionally, there'll be some metadata. And this metadata, in the case of Juke Join, will pertain to all of the concerns captured in that thought. And these concerns also match the names of the receptors. So we get back a thought and we know which receptors correspond to the concerns that the thought expresses. And this is then used to update the character who thought that thought's mind. Let's look at how this works. So character thinks the thought we're gonna update this accordingly. How we do this is we look at the metadata attached to that thought. In this case, it's three concerns, disappointment, do depart, and my job. And then here, we isolate those receptors. 
And for each, we increment the voltage by one. And for each synapse connecting any two of these, we increment the weights on those synapses by one. And then in the case that there's not a synapse yet, for any pair of concerns here, any pair of receptors rather, we simply build a new synapse and give it a default starting weight, say 1.0. So what's happened here is a character has thought a thought and merely by virtue of having thought that particular thought, having used that particular content, the character changed. Their mind updated by virtue of that thought that they thought. So what we see here is a feedback loop where a character thinks a thought, where content is generated for a character, and that generated content fundamentally changes who that character is. And when that character is fundamentally changed in this way, this affects the thoughts that they may have in the future. This affects the content that may be generated for them in the future. So we find a feedback loop between character and content. The content generated for this character fundamentally changes who they are. When they are fundamentally changed in this way, that affects what future content may be generated for them. This is a character content feedback loop. Now in juke joint, one interesting byproduct of this character content feedback loop is character arcs. In this game, we can think of arcs as per pertaining to the dilemma at hand, whether to stay or leave, right? This dilemma that each of these characters is facing in this example. And I said that the decision procedure looks something like this. They're each moving left and right along their own personal scale. But actually it looks more like this. Each one has a scale pertaining to each of the possible outcomes, whether to stay or leave. And this system is driven entirely by these special receptors right here. Do depart and don't depart, corresponding to stay and leave respectively. So where a particular character is on each of these scales is totally driven by the voltage on these receptors. Those voltages are where they are at along those scales. So we say that each scale is on a range between 0 and 18. Uh, as far as 18, we just reach that through testing and tuning. It's, it may seem arbitrary, it kind of is, except it was uh, achieved through tuning. And so if a particular character, let's say, is at 17 on the voltage of one of these special receptors, and then they move to 18, well, that looks like this. That's them reaching a decision. So in that case, that character would have decided to leave as a final decision. At this point, a special procedure kicks in. So we look in the mind of this character, we take the particular receptor corresponding to the decision they have made. In this case, this character will depart. And then we take the three most heavily weighted synapses extending out from that receptor. And we can think of these synapses as connecting the decision to the most prominent reasons for this decision. Because as this machinery was being built up by the character's stream of consciousness proceeding, these were the concerns that constantly and frequently linked back to do depart. So these are the reasons, if you will, for making the decision, which in fact they have just made. And what we're going to do is rank these. So this town has the highest synapse weight. So that's probably their biggest reason for wanting to leave. No romance here is the second highest weight, and then new job elsewhere. So we rank these, red, orange, yellow, if you will, in order of the synapse weights, because the synapse weights capture how frequently each concern was linked to this idea of departing the town. So we take these, 
and then generate a special thought which expresses the decision, but also the reasons for the decision. So here's an example here. The character says it's all so clear now. I know what to do and for three good reasons. First of all, in the yellow text, I have a great job lined up in Detroit. So this expresses that concern of new job elsewhere. Second, I'm making a fool of myself chasing after Sam all the time. That's no romance here. And it's an orange text, as you can see. Most importantly, I don't fit in here. I'm ditching this terrible bird. So this thought captures and expresses the decision and also the concerns that are the reasons for this character making the decision. Now we know all of this information because it came from here, the character's mind. All of that information, the decision they made, the reasons they had for making it, are encoded in this structure here. Just as earlier I talked about how you can look at the snapshot of a character's mind to get a sense of who they are, the life they've led, the difficulties and concerns that they're up against. Well, this is a perfect example of being able to do that. And not only can a human do that, our system does it. It doesn't know what a town is. It doesn't know what no romance here means, all these connotations. It has no idea about any of that. It just knows how to evolve a system like this according to content that has been generated. And at the end, you can use those synapse weights as basically a cheap trick to realize what this character's reasoning must have been all through their stream of consciousness. This is all enabled, of course, by character content feedback loops. Now I wanna end the talk with some brief discussion of this idea. Non-player characters in games are so often like vending machines. You push a button, content comes out, that content is used by the character. You push another button, more content comes out, that content is used by the character. It's a disjointed sequence of calls and responses where none of the calls and responses have anything to do with what came before. Now, when we think about procedural generation, well, we don't have canned units of content as with this vending machine. So maybe it's more like something like this, a machine that produces coffee on demand. So now you say, okay, it's time for content. You push a button and then generated content is produced on the fly to satisfy your demand. And then that content is used by the character. And then you push another button, more content is generated, and that content is used by the character. But the character, the vending machine, isn't calling back to what's happened before. Again, it's a disjointed sequence of calls and responses where the calls and responses have nothing to do with what's come before. More troublingly, in the case of generating content for non-player characters, what that character says doesn't change them or the game world in any way. We're all familiar with the uh, unfortunate case of the quest giver who gives the same canned response to the same queries over and over and over, even if it's back to back to back. That character is a vending machine who has no internal world. And we find this all too often, I think, in procedural contexts. When I say something, that changes me in some way. Certainly when characters in narrative media say things, it changes them in the story world, often in significant ways. That's creative writing 101. But we often find procedural generation used as a means to its own end. Once you have the generated content, you win. That's what you wanted. But I'm interested in seeing generated content that exists in a larger sequence where you're generating content in sequences where subsequent units call back to the previous ones, where you have through lines through what's being generated, where what's generated actually changes the world. In this case, actually changes the characters who use that content. 
And this should all sound somewhat familiar at this point, because in Juke Joint, when a character thinks a thought, that thought fundamentally changes them. And when they're fundamentally changed, the thoughts they can think in the future are changed. We have a feedback loop between generated content and character. Of course, while I'm interested in characters personally, this could apply to larger systems like game worlds and so forth. But I'm interested in this feedback loop between generated content and some context that is instantiated in the gameplay. Character content feedback loops are something I am interested in. I hope I've garnered some interest in this topic for you, or maybe you just thought Juke Joint was interesting. Juke Joint will be coming out 2018. We are seeking writing collaborators for this project. If you're a writer who works in procedural contexts and you're interested in this project here, uh, go ahead and drop me a line. This was a Proc Jam 2017 talk. I'd like to thank the organizers of this fabulous game jam, and this fabulous community. Particular shout out to my friend Michael Cook, who invited me to give this talk. My name is James Ryan. You can find more about me and what I talked about and many things I did not at my personal website. It's jamesryan.world. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I really appreciate you being a part of this community. Thank you.